When Michael Andretti stepped off the podium at the Italian Grand Prix in 1993, he knew he just made his last F1 start. And if you asked him back then if he'd ever want to set foot in an F1 paddock again, the answer would almost certainly have been no, which makes his current desire to get back in as a team owner 30 years later all the more amusing. And it was unthinkable that he would ever want to team up with McLaren again, which happened when they joined forces to run Fernando Alonso's first crack at the Indy 500 in 2017. Andretti has said those 13 races in F1 nearly ruined his career, and you can see why. While Ayrton Senna was taking the fight to Williams and Alain Prost from the other side of the garage, Andretti had an average starting position of around 10th, spun or crashed out of six races, and only scored points three times. By mid-season, he was fighting race by race to keep his seat, with McLaren keen to give test driver Mika Hakkinen a shot alongside Senna instead. Despite ending on a high, it was a nightmare, and both Michael and his legendary father Mario, the F1 world champion in 1978 who was desperate to see his son succeed there too, believe it might not have been coincidence that Michael's attempt to crack F1 went so badly. Could there really have been a conspiracy behind all this, or was it just bad luck, bad timing and simply Andretti doing a bad job in the second best car on the grid? Andretti had been on McLaren's radar for some time, signing a testing deal with them as far back as 1991, the year he would go on to win his only IndyCar title in America. But by the time he landed his race seat for 1993, it couldn't have been a worse time to make the switch. That year was the peak for high-tech gizmo F1 cars before drive raids were banned for 1994. So while F1 cars were always more refined than their Indy counterparts, the gap was never bigger than it was that year. But despite all the tech he had to adapt to in F1, Andretti actually liked that side of things. He enjoyed being able to program the car to do whatever you wanted, although as we'll come back to later, he felt his car didn't always do what it was supposed to. What made his failed F1 excursion even more painful was the fact that Nigel Mansell took his IndyCar seat with the Newman Haas team and famously won the championship as a rookie. Andretti knew he was in for a good season if he'd stayed, he even talked of being able to win every race because the Lola Ford package looked so good. But when he started having second thoughts about signing his McLaren deal, Mario told him he'd be crazy not to go. Michael has since said, that's the last time I ever listened to dad. To make matters worse, Andretti joined just as McLaren lost its works Honda engines, and after a bid to land the same Renault engines as Williams failed, McLaren had to settle for customer Ford V8s. But that deal was done so late that the team had little time to get its car ready for the new campaign, so Andretti only got a day and a half of testing in the MP4-8 before the season started. That problem was compounded by one of F1's most pointless rules, which came in at the worst possible time for Andretti. In a useless attempt to cut costs, the number of laps a driver could complete during practice was limited to 23 per session, with another 12 per day for qualifying across Friday and Saturday. This was a disaster for a driver trying to learn a new type of car and a bunch of tracks he'd never seen before, so there's no question the odds were stacked against Andretti. Despite this, he qualified in the top six for three of his first four races and was in the top nine on the grid for all of his first six Grand Prix. The problem was things kept going wrong on Sundays. Andretti was either let down by his car or crashing or spinning out of races far too often. His biggest regret from the whole year was colliding with Carl Wendlinger at the start of the Donington race, where Senna put in one of his most famous drives. In recent years, Andretti has described it as the one thing he still shoots himself over because he knew from the warm-up how good his car was going to be in the wet that day. Andretti's qualifying performances took a dive mid-season. He'd qualified in the top 10 in all of the first six races, but in the next six, he wasn't in the top 10 once. McLaren boss Ron Dennis tried to put things right in Canada with a pep talk, where he told Andretti, from now on, race the way that you want to race, and we'll just live with the consequences. If you fall off, you fall off. But it didn't work. There were more errors and more car problems, and the only reason Andretti got to make one final start at Monza was because Mario begged Ron Dennis to let him race, given the family's Italian heritage. Andretti arrived at McLaren at a time of internal turmoil. As well as losing Honda, for much of the off-season between 1992 and 93, it looked like McLaren would lose Senna too. This led to Andretti and Mika Hakkinen being named as the team's driver lineup, with Hakkinen moved aside when Senna signed at the last minute, initially on a race-by-race -race deal for $1 million per race. The problem was, Hakkinen was promised he would get a chance to race later in the year. McLaren even submitted paperwork to the FIA to confirm that if any teams dropped off the grid and numbers fell below 26 cars, they would run a third car for Hakkinen. 
That scenario never materialised, so when Senna committed to the rest of the season prior to the French Grand Prix, Andretti was doomed. Andretti says that from that weekend onwards, Ron Dennis told him he wanted him out of the car so Hakkinen could drive and the Andrettis had to fight race to race to keep the seat. The other thing that Mario believes always worked against Andretti was that Senna's last-minute U-turn left McLaren with two expensive drivers while a young, fast and cheap test driver was sat on the sidelines. When Andretti was moved aside for Hakkinen with three races to go, it wasn't an immediate firing. Dennis told Michael that he couldn't let him know until November if he'd be able to retain him for the following season. Mario wanted Michael to back himself and wait it out, confident that Michael would be paired with Hakkinen for 1994, with Senna in the process of signing for Williams. I blame Michael for not being patient. He certainly didn't feel welcome, but uh, he had to overlook that. I would have waited, you know, to see how it played out because uh, if he would have stayed, you know, for the second season, you know, uh, was sent out of the way, then then it would have been a full effort behind him. But he gave that up and it's unfortunate. But Andretti had an offer on the table to return to IndyCar with Chip Ganassi and he didn't want to lose it. He said years later he was over F1 by that point and he felt nobody was going to touch him with a 10-foot pole, so he was better off going back to America, enjoying his racing again and rebuilding his damaged reputation. McLaren tried to be supportive early in the season, but by the middle of the year the tone changed. After the first six races, the team felt Andretti had lost his way and was being too conservative. In the summer, Dennis fueled speculation around Andretti's future with a bizarre statement where he said, We pride ourselves on fulfilling our legal and moral commitments to drivers. If any driver did not complete a season in a McLaren car for which he was contracted, it would only happen by mutual agreement. The frenzy that comment caused forced Dennis to clarify it, but his clarification only made things worse. He said he didn't think Andretti was enjoying F1 and that it was hurting his career. And he said that if Michael wanted to go back to IndyCar, McLaren wouldn't hold him to his contract. Ron claimed this didn't mean he wanted to replace Andretti, but it looked like a pretty clear hint for Michael to see what opportunities might be waiting for him back in America. Andretti said in 2018 when reflecting on the season with American journalist Marshall Pruitt that he despised McLaren until the Zac Brown era began in the mid-2010s. He said the team now knew how to have fun, whereas with Ron, you weren't allowed to have fun. If you ever look up stories around Andretti's brief stint in F1, it won't be long before you find tales of how he held himself back because he didn't relocate to Europe. Andretti disagrees. He said he embedded himself with the team for a couple of months at the start of the year, but after constantly being told he wasn't needed in the factory, he didn't see the point in hanging around just to be seen. He says he stayed on the European time zone while living in America and was in regular contact with the team over the phone. He also points out that this was back in the days of Concord, when you could fly from the US to the UK in under three and a half hours. Andretti said that meant he could get to the McLaren base in almost the same amount of time it would take Senna to do it from Monaco, although that's stretching how long a flight from the south of France to London would take. Andretti said Dennis liked to use the refusal to relocate from America as an excuse, and in other interviews he has been stronger, saying it wouldn't have made any difference, and anyone who thinks it did is clueless. So, was this all just a case of wrong place, wrong time? The Andrettis think there might be more to it. The timing of Senna committing to the rest of 1993 just ahead of the French Grand Prix looks significant, because that's the weekend when the biggest accusation that's been made by the Andrettis supposedly took place. The Andrettis say the beacon on Michael's car was shut off during qualifying in France, meaning the car didn't know where it was on the track, so the driver aids, such as active suspension, couldn't behave in the way they were supposed to from corner to corner. That led to Andretti's worst qualifying performance of the year down in 16th place. Active suspension systems were capable of going wrong on their own, but Andretti believes this was done intentionally by someone who wanted him out of the team. And he said in the past he thinks that stemmed from a motivation led by former F1 ringmaster Bernie Eccleston and that Andretti was used. Michael told veteran US journalist Gordon Kirby that he felt he was destined to fail from day one in F1 because Eccleston wanted to discredit IndyCar racing. If that sounds far-fetched, there are a few factors to consider. IndyCar had been on the rise for a few years by this point, and Bernie had been taking shots even before F1 lost its world champion in Mansell to the series. He kept challenging IndyCar to a head-to-head -head race with F1 cars and claiming that no IndyCar drivers would even qualify if they entered an F1 race. 
Bernie later bought Mansell out of his IndyCar contract to get him back on the F1 grid for 1995, and a year later he helped engineer Jacques Villeneuve's move to Williams, costing IndyCar one of its most famous names and the reigning Indy 500 and series champion. So the idea that Eccleston would want to hurt IndyCar racing makes sense. The bit that doesn't quite add up though is why McLaren would agree to hobble one of its own drivers. Yes, as Mario Andretti said, it had a cheap alternative in Hakkinen waiting in the wings, but any race team would surely have preferred to see two of its cars up the front every weekend if that was possible. Michael has a counter to that. He told Gordon Kirby that Dennis and Eccleston were in it together and that the racing was secondary to making millions of dollars. Years later on the Marshall Pruitt podcast, he was a bit less direct but still hinted at feeling used, saying, I understand why things happened, why people did what they did. It was never a personal thing. It was, because of where I was in my career over here, sort of just used in a different way. McLaren had told Andretti during 1991, before he won the IndyCar title, that it wanted him for 1993. If that was part of a dastardly plan with Eccleston to discredit IndyCar racing, then everyone involved was certainly prepared to play the long game. Might McLaren have lost interest in Andretti as the year went on and he kept making clumsy errors? With hacking and waiting in the wings, it's plausible. But would they go into business with Bernie Eccleston to sacrifice one of their own cars to hurt IndyCar racing, a series they'd recently considered joining themselves at that point? The conviction the Andretti speak with on this subject makes a convincing case, but it still seems a bit of a stretch to us.